So with that, I guess we'll get started and you know, just kind of call the order. Roll call is okay. Um, bold business was sort of the communications portal update. Um, um, you had some conversations. We're going to have some conversations about what people wanted. You've done some listening sessions or something. I just saw that at the library. Yes. Uh, yeah, they've been very, I think, very successful. They have not been as well attended as one might have hoped for. Um, but the people that came were engaged and really had some good insight. Um, did a good job of also kind of staying mostly on the topic of hand, like trying to steer them away from specific concerns. Um, there were some people certainly who were eager to have a, uh, to be connected with the town or the school that they could, you know, suggest improvements to. Um, but, Mostly what, I, yeah. Yeah. Um, mostly what I heard was that there's definitely a generational split, that if you are over 80, the leader is really your main source of information regarding what's happening within the town, that that is a, um, a channel that we need to continue to use if we want to be reaching all of our citizens. And then a um, fair number of people are accessing information through the website. Uh, I was surprised at the number of people that knew and it may be that the people that were attracted to come into a listening session were already people that were engaged yeah. in the budget. Um, but the number of people that already knew that they could access information about the budget from the website and um, were willing to do so was nice to see. Um, we do have you know, almost 3,000 people that follow the town on Facebook, and they are engaged in um, listening to those conversations. We have 1,000 people that subscribe to the town's newsletter. So that's another um, fairly significant portion of the population that we're able to reach. It was, I especially enjoyed going in, I went to two different story times and um, hung out prior to and after, speaking to the parents that were there to play after the story time. Yeah. Um, and it's a demographic that we don't often get to reach, I think, so mostly, and this is a generalization, but almost exclusively it was women between, you know, in early 20s to early 30s. Um, and they're not coming to nighttime meetings because they very often are putting kids to bed. And so it was good to hear their thoughts, and um, they had even recruited somebody for one of our town boards. That was especially <laughs> exciting. Um, but most of what I heard was a mixed bag between people that were really happy with the budget process, people that weren't aware of anything to do with the budget process and hadn't taken the time to think about it prior, um, and people that had some um, misgivings based on past practice. I think one of the best conversations I had, though, was with somebody this last listening session at the library who really commended the town for the effort they put forward in the last couple of years to improve the process and felt that although he felt that there was still a lot of room to grow, that he did recognize the amount of effort that had gone forward and, and the improvement made. Oh, so how, how did that break out? You said there's some that aren't aware at all of the budget and some that you know kind of follow it. And I mean, how did it kind of break out? Was the majority? I would say it was because, I, again, we have a, a self-selecting population. So within the, um, within the, I'm going to put myself someplace that nobody is expecting me really, and I'm just going to insert myself into their, their, yeah. their space, those are definitely more like 75% of the people that are like, yeah, I, I know we have a budget, but that's not really something I've ever thought about. How much? So, yeah. And so that really? was the younger, the younger yeah, moms. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. The caregivers. Yes. And I also will admit, so my son plays indoor soccer through the direct program, and I'm just sitting there surrounded by parents, and I'm like, so this may be inappropriate, but does anyone want to talk to me about the budget? <laughs> 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 you have arrived. Yeah, welcome. Yeah, welcome. So um, I think that in general, the people that were not actively seeking to speak to me about budget engagement were the people that were 75% of them, they engaged the budget, they get their tax bill. Yeah. And so that's, I think that's good information to have and really good to know going forward. Yeah. Um, and then I did have one gentleman at a listening session who was not aware of anything to do with our budgeting process, but was there to learn. He wanted to know more about it. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, that's really great. I'm so excited that you want to do that. I was really hoping, though, to hear from you about who would like us to do that. So we ended up instead having one of my favorite conversations, which was a much higher level philosophical conversation about the role of government. So that was good. <laughs> <laughs> so so when, what did you take away as things that we did well and things that we could do better or, you know, sort of, where, where did we nail it and where did we, where do people still see gaps or okay. common themes or? Trust is still an issue. If, if the people that were aware of the budget process and, and were displeased, the word distrust or lack of trust, or trust was definitely a continuing theme throughout the conversation. And so, you know, that kind of idea of how do we work to build trust. Um, I don't know if any of you read the newsletter, but that was actually, I chose to use that as the focus of my contribution last month 
talking about um, relationships needing to be built on trust and, and trying to use that platform to work on that a little bit. Um, the other thing, like I said, about the leader, I think that if we if we want to be doing targeted outreach, which I think we do, to our septuagenarian, octogenarian, and nonagenarian population, then we need to be respectful of how they're accessing. And if you did not work, for, if your career did not involve the internet, you're not most likely to be carrying that forward into your retirement. And so um, those efforts, I think we just need to be really consistent with making sure we're using the leader. And, um, and most of them, actually, it was interesting, I was like, well, the cable channel is there. And it was, I went to a senior luncheon program and, and popped from table to table, and half of them have cable and half of them have dish, and so the dish people have no access and to that. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Clarissa, was there any feedback in terms of how to garner trust? It was just, we don't trust them. Was there any, any ex suggestions on how we might? There were examples of why they don't trust, but not yeah. examples of how they could learn to trust. And I think okay. that, you know, I think we all know that just from our own personal relationships, right? Like, building trust takes years, losing it takes a minute. Yeah. So, um, I think it, I, I tried to convey a message of, you know, continually positive, like the town is working very hard at complete transparency, that, you know, the, and I did hear some interesting feedback that two people actually shared with me that they appreciated the efforts to transparency by supplying greater amounts of documents but that that in itself became obfuscation. That if you are supplying too much information, mm -hmm. that a 401 page budget is yeah. no more accessible, then that there's a there's a, a way to work that. So that nice one page thing though, right? right that <laughs> I, I, did, I did share that with a couple people that got some positive feedback, okay, like, great, that would be helpful. Um, and I also um, spoke to IT about how we can make that 401 page document searchable, how we can make it clickable so that if when you're looking at the index, you if you're interested in something, you just immediately go there. Yeah. And that that makes it, instead <coughs> of a barrier, that makes it actually accessible. And when I shared that idea with the two gentlemen that were expressing their concern, they both felt that that would improve the process. And those were two separate events. They weren't feeding off of each other. They were two separate people and two separate listening sessions. So um, I think that what I came away with was kind of a positive sense of we seem to be heading in the right direction. There are definitely ways to make information. We're doing a great job of making information completely available to everyone, but that doesn't mean that it's actually accessible to everyone. And so how do we improve accessibility, I think, is the next step. Transparency, we're on. But um, one of the kind of metaphors I kind of like is that I think we are a completely glass-walled town hall, but glass walls are still barriers. And so we're, at this point, we're trying to figure out a way to um, make it so that there's easy flow in and out of this. Is there anything we can do on, this, on the Board of Ed side to help promote your listening sessions? Because I just happened to, I knew you were doing them, and then I happened to see it as I was driving by the library. They had been promoting it. Is there, you know, if you have certain dates or things that are open to the public, obviously if it's a senior, luncheon, we wouldn't promote that just because right. you don't want random people walking in, but if it's at the library or here at Town Hall. That's a great question. I don't have any more scheduled. I'd be happy to schedule a couple a couple more, especially with the attendance at um, the library one specifically. The librarians are very gracious and very welcoming, and they did a great job trying to promote it. Mm -hmm. People are just, you know, they're, they're busy. Nice. I'm also wondering if we could do like a, uh, maybe a, a, a short physical survey, like a one-page type thing we could do at a community dialogue, we could do it at the all, all boards conference whenever we get a group of people together to say, hey, if you get a second, fill that survey out in the back and, and, and we're going to get 100%, but at least get some kind of feedback and typically have a fairly decent mix of both places. I don't know if that's something we can And we're also talking about from a council standpoint, putting things at like Summerfest, Winterfest, putting a, a, a council booth there, basically having that man with information or people to be able to get information and that kind of stuff. So. Um, I don't know if there's another way to, to you know, I mean, instead of having you, I mean, it's great to have that one-on-one -on -one contact, but to utilize that venue or our different venues where we, we've got a, a different mix of people that you know, aren't at the library, but say sure. a, a senior's niche. And surveying is extremely powerful, right? Like, survey, but I think that I would encourage that if you did something like that, the community dialogue, that you still have the survey area staffed, mm -hmm. and that um, 
I had, so I did some internship work with um, Congress Square Park in Portland, and we were surveying throughout the summer. And it worked really well. We had a survey form that was able to just be on an iPad. And so then the data is immediately downloaded into the, the what you're processing it with, which is extremely helpful instead of having paper surveys. Mm -hmm. um, and having a staff person that's able to say, hey, would you have like three minutes to fill the survey for, out for me? They can actually be working the survey and clicking the buttons for people if they want to, and so you're able to engage with a larger audience than you might otherwise. Um, and coming up with the survey language, if, if what you want to focus on is on trust, if you want to direct me on that, I'd be happy to work up surveys that you guys could choose from. Or, um, but, and I'm happy to schedule more dates if you would like me to, and certainly would enjoy brainstorming about how the school could, um, it's a population I didn't reach outside of those young parents at <coughs> story time and the handful of parents that sit next to me during soccer practice. Um, I did not actually speak to any parents. That you guys have to still do PTO, PTA meetings? There are PTO and PTA meetings through the, like the yeah. different schools. Yeah. And I, and I think it's interesting. A communication meeting with us. Oh, yeah. I'll talk sure. to you about it. Okay. Um, I think it's interesting because the, the young parents is always sort of um, that group that we have a hard time reaching. Story time. <laughs> They're there. <laughs> no, no. So, Larissa, you've been going to um, established events and meeting people on, on that turf, if you will, rather than just say, hey, hey I'm a town hall from two to four, stop in and see me, right? Right. And maybe it'd be helpful just to review the different listening set, different things you've attended, just to get a sense of the cross-section. So sure. story times. Two story times, um, the senior luncheon, 55 plus luncheon, um, at Camp Petra before I moved. And then I did have two set-aside listening sessions at the library. One of them was mid-afternoon, uh, midday, it was like 11 to 1 at the libraries to try to catch that crowd of people, and one was from 6.30 to, I ended up being till 8 this past um, Tuesday night at the library. And that was done through um, really very kind gentleman, Sam Kelly, who runs the Let's Talk America series, and he facilitated that. He didn't want it to be a, a Let's Talk America event, but he did use his membership to reach out and try to promote that event. I think there's something valuable to it not being a survey, and it being Larissa. Um, I think, or or whoever. I just feel like there's you automatically create a connection as opposed to filling out the survey to touch here. Yeah. So thank you for doing that. Well, I think people, I think, were pleased. I think that it's um, they were pleased to see somebody outside of the town hall. Um, and uh, but I think that they also need to hear clearly that they're of course always welcome in the town hall that people are busy and that they can't always be outside of the town hall. And so how to, I think that working on how to communicate that, that our staff is happy to speak to people and is welcoming of people coming in, um, but uh, that we need to start creating that welcoming atmosphere of the house. So one thing I'm just wondering about, because I um, had similar experiences as I was you know, entering into the district and having lots of opportunities to meet with folks, and I got a lot of similar input um, about a variety of issues the way Larissa was able to. And just when we were thinking about how do you establish trust, I think that that helped me establish trust and credibility with our community. And so I'm just wondering if there's value of experienced council members or you know the town manager to do events like that, if that would be helpful as we're trying to move forward and show that there's <coughs> a desire to have so, so I, I think in the past, what we've done is we've um, taken this, you know, the road show, basically. The, the, and I think Tom, I don't know, if, I think a couple times, I think it was both you and you and George, or it was a combination of the council and the school board finance or something, um, go down to like Pepper Shores or something and get in kind of the overall budget. Once it's presented, kind of here's the process kind of thing. But I, I mean, I think that's, you know, if, if we could find a way to, to, to broaden that a little bit instead of having, you know, you guys, the staff that's doing a lot of other things as well. I mean, I, I think if we could divide it, conquer up and say, you know, you know, a school board member and a counselor team up and go at different places, you know, I mean, if we just start here at finance and say, you know, let's let's go do uh, Hyper Shores or let's go to Martin's Point or let's do Martin's Point or the, yeah, or the Rotary or something. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's, you know, once we get that kind of agreed to structure and format, I think that would be from a budget standpoint. You know, if we wanted to do other things like, you know, survey outreach or trust or develop somebody, we could do that pretty much any time. You know? Yeah, I think we do. Yeah, I was just going to say, didn't I, I thought I heard <laughs> that you guys, the town council is doing something similar to that. 
right? Where well, yeah, there's going to be you know there's we the town council set up sort of a new <coughs> communication committee, and the intent is to how do we deal with some of these issues we're just talking about? How do we create more dialogue and more trust? So one thing they are going to try, who knows how that's going to work. Right. Um, you know, Kate St. Clair is the chair, but she suggested having just invite people to come in instead of having it a formal sort of you have to come to the podium and speak, just to come around a table like this and just ask questions. And the promise was, we're not sure we'll be able to answer all your questions, but we're willing to at least listen to whatever is on your mind. So right. we'll let you know how that goes, but that could be a great, great sort of and I think if I recall, Tom, we also looked at doing that several years ago, and it, and it wasn't so much a, it wasn't a concern, but I think one of the pitfalls we have to be careful of is if, it's, if there isn't some kind of structure or purpose to it, sometimes it could be, you, you, you tend to, to get people there who are one, one topic people or something that yeah. are just, you know, I'm not saying that that could happen now, and you always run that risk, but I, I think mm -hmm. if we had a goal or a theme or, or something where, you know, um, you know, a trust survey or, you know, just even communi you know, a communication steam or something that we could prepare. Cookies, cookies, exactly. In the past, individual counselors would do office hours, and sometimes they were across oh, the street at oh. the coffee shop yeah. right here, and office hours. Almost to a person, they were, you know, the, the first couple were okay, one yeah. or two people come in, and then it would fizzle out. No, 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 you know, I don't wish that on this process, but I, I predict that that's going to be a challenge to get people to come out and uh, just sit and engage in conversation. Yeah. So it's worth trying. Yeah. I am no so And we can kind of function. What if you had, like, this is kind of a little bit silly, maybe, but what if you did have, like, a quarterly cookies with council? I mean, you could have a, you know, quarterly set up. You've got a couple of counselors. I love alliteration. You've got a couple of counselors, one at each table. You've got sure. coffee and cookies, and people can come in, and it might fizzle. But if, even if you've got three decently yeah. decent quarterly events, that's almost a year of trust right. building that's taking place. And I like that, but I like the joint thing. I mean, if we that's have right. a counselor yes. and, a, and a school board member there, I think that's, it shows a couple. It shows unity. It shows working together. And also, it, you know, there might be questions that the, the council can't answer that a school board member has to answer, and vice versa. It might be questions the school board can't answer that the council, councilor has to answer. So I think if we're there kind of jointly, rep representing both, not both sides, but both aspects of it, yeah. I, I mean, I think one that budget. Would, so. Right. Yeah, one council, yeah, one budget, then, you know. Yeah. Just a question. You know, this is, we're, we're talking about a communication portal sort of strategy, but you kind of led the way with what you've done. Have you, it's, we went out with Diego or two days ago. Have you got any type of response or any type of sense? Of, is it reaching people or people? It is people? reaching people. Um, a, a lot of <laughs> staff, because obviously that went right to their inbox yeah. and just kind of waiting for the word to spread a little bit. Um, we posted it on our website and we we're also sending some letters out to some key communicators in the, in the community at Rotary at Kelowna so that they know that it's there and that it's available. Um, and you know, I started today talking with some students about it and showing them, mm -hmm. you know, go home and tell your parents about it. So um, we plan to also highlight it in the next town newsletter so that folks, really it'll be like, this is the episode for the month. Yeah. So and here's all the different ways you can access it. And then next month we'll launch a new episode focusing on a different school or a different phase level. So um, it would make some sense that is that a model we should try maybe around the joint budget process that so have an episode a month or something that get it we're going to get to look budget drivers but start start because we had talked about doing that communication a little bit ahead of time mm -hmm. especially if we knew there were going to be whatever issues there may be if there's a particular investment one to make and we wanted to explain it like going back a couple of years it was the laptops yep. and i'm not sure a lot of people understood the reasons why and what we're thinking in the application but as we think about different communication strategies that is that and that kind of plays just reaching a different audience um, and the only other thing too is that there are 3,000 people on Facebook. Is it a pretty diverse demographic that's on Facebook? Would we reach a cross section or don't we know? We make a very nice, um, very standard bell curve. So between the ages of 30 and 55, we are reaching a good amount of people, and then we have a serious taper under 30 and over 55. So, question about the Facebook thing too. Any anybody, you know, you're not just a town resident because I've seen some of the I know, don't trust from that. people, so you can figure but out so how many are town residents versus yes. how many are not. We have so we have about three thousand Facebook followers, a little over like twenty two hundred, I believe, list their addresses Scarborough, okay. which means they could have been from Scarborough in the past, like mine. Mm -hmm. Sure, 
that's okay. the case. So it's not necessarily that they are current residents. No, but when I look at the neighboring towns, I'm, I'm, I feel pretty positive about um, the ability to reach out. So even people that aren't following us, when we post like passport day, I think is a good indicator because those are really catered to kind of Scarborough residents. Mm -hmm. And that post was shared enough to have reached for the Eastern Trail like, oh, yeah. to 4.2 thousand. So it's definitely um, a good way to right. reach at least that 30 to 55. 69 percent of our population of followers is also female. So we, we do have some skewed demographics, but they're there. Okay. And what we see with our uh, like official Facebook posts looks different. Our pages looks different than what you see as like an individual user. So we have access to <coughs> data than than you do because it's set up like a business. I was thinking one thing this group could do is we could serve as what do you want to say, ambassadors, but we could come up with similar collateral material that we're armed with and that in our personal pursuits or social or professional, uh, as you have an opportunity to, to talk with people, we have maybe a one-page infograph that, that gives kind of the big picture of the budget. Um, but we all be armed with that and have it available when the opportunity presents itself, so it's not necessarily a an orchestrated planned effort, but we just all engage when, when the opportunity presents. I think those chance encounters can be really powerful and dynamic because people are engaged with you in whatever location you're at, they're excited to meet you, and then you're giving them really helpful information so that they then can be like, oh, I talked to the town manager today, and this is what he said. Um, or I talked to a school board member today, or a town counselor today, and I'm just thinking about one of our students who um, it's kind of like a, it's actually a really cute story, like as we've been working on the main boys to men, he's like, do you know who follows me on Twitter? Like he was so excited that the superintendent is tagging him <laughs> on Twitter. Oh, and so I just thought, like, what is the, like what's the power of that? Right, right? And people feel really empowered. Like, you make that connection and they feel really empowered that you shared critical information. So I almost feel like now I'm an insider because I have that that real just-in-time knowledge. So I love the idea of maximizing that potential. Okay. So does it make some sense from this that is anybody interested in sort of doing a between this meeting and the next meeting just some legwork to, I mean, there could be a couple things. If Facebook do a survey to ask some of the questions, said something about trust and whether we get some information there, whether it makes any sense. I know Kate St. Clair would approach the, the TV they're really excited about doing some different things. Should we maybe think about your suggestion, buddies? Could there be some programming that would have a counselor and a, and a, and a board advocacy member that would just start that dialogue about, hey, here are things that are going on, and do you have any questions? I, I think, I mean, you know, we, again, we're, we're, I don't want to reinvent the wheel again, but we talked a, a, a few years ago about actually doing a sit down where you had yeah. an interview. You know, as someone a moderator or something, basically, yeah. you know, you collect questions or even a, a I don't know, kind of a, the logistics of doing a live phone in show, but but you, know, you basically have like meet meet the counselor or meet yeah, the, yeah. meet the meet the meet the board member, and you sit there and you know you, someone like a um, a Kevin um, Kevin Freeman or something, yeah. you know, asking a series of yeah. questions, and you know just kind of going back and forth, and even if it's a you know, 10, 15 minute little vignette or something, yeah. when you sit down. Um, Anybody I, interested? In I think the challenge we had, Tom, if I remember, it was more logistics, I think, wasn't it? Or, or No, it's, it's commitment. Exactly. Right. No, we have the capability of doing it. It's a matter of production time. It's uh, coming up with content and consistency. And, and it's hard to do that time and time again. Right. Technically, we have all the capabilities of collecting video. We, we did something. Do you remember, Kate? We, we did. We had a round table conversation, and yeah. it was about the budget, and yeah. it was did it with members and leadership team both sitting together, and we were filmed, and I think it was on the, the local access. And it was exactly that. It was sort of a, here are some of the interesting things we're going to be talking about in budget season. Here's some of the stuff, the challenges we're facing. And, um, you know, I, I think that it wasn't something that we did more than twice or three times. Yeah, there were several times. topics yeah. and um, could people call in? No, it wasn't a call in, but people could come to the audience. They were put out there at people stage, sitting remember? in the audience and you had but you had the group sitting around and just having sort of a round table chat. I think the thing that was missing from that, well aside from not having any idea who saw it, I mean you put it out there and you hope that people are viewing it. Uh, but the piece that I think that keep, we keep coming back to is how do you engage in the conversation directly with the person? 
And right. when folks come and, and they come to our meetings, they stand at the podium, they make their statement or they ask their questions. And because of Robert's rules and because it's a formal meeting and because you know we're following a pro protocol, <coughs> counselors and board members can't say, yeah, I get that. Let me tell you what's really going on. Yeah, Here's right. the answer to your question. That's the part where he, people feel like a disconnect and they, they feel as though they're sort of speaking and no one's hearing them. And I think that's the power of what Larissa's doing, which is she is hearing them. And she's talking with them back and forth. So I, I think it depends on what our goals are going to be. I mean, if we want to communicate certain cost drivers or you know really do a deep dive on a certain issue or, or an item that we really want to get information on, I think it's you know we could do a round table kind of thing where we really get down into the weeds and stuff and, and try and come up with you know questions that we think are going to be asked ahead of time yeah. or even collect questions or something. I think if we wanted to do a dialogue or an exchange kind of thing, I mean I like the little you know going to different venues. I mean there's enough stuff we've got a community calendar now that Seiko's trying to coordinate. If we just went down through that list and said, you know Hey, there's a Kiwanis meeting. You know, two of us go and say, you know, well, let's 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 just be available there. You know, we're here to answer questions, whatever your questions are. Uh, you know, if you don't if you don't have any questions, we can tell you about where we are in the process. You know, um, but but sorry, but I, but I do think we, part of this process needs to be coming up with with the common language, and we started to do that the past few years of work. So we've got the right. I mean, to Tom's point, you know, we've all got the same you know, I say the same talking points, kind of things, but, but we're all kind of on the same theme, yeah. the same yeah. message is going out uniformly, so we don't have, you know, kind of scattered in, you know, reactionary responses and stuff going on. Chris, the company has some plans to have activity with it, but it only comes up once every 10 years. Right. That's the problem. Right. Uh, I, I shouldn't say anything. Just, <laughs> no, no, you're 100% yeah, 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 right. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, I find that uh, uh, what happens is you do the budget, Accept it, and you never hear that again. Mm -hmm. You have a review. Many, many years ago, uh, 50 years ago, I was on the finance committee for the New England Telephone Company for Maine. I had, we had, we got involved with, with great increases. We got involved with changing activities and things, and to sit with the Public Utility Commission and people asking us questions as, what are you going to do with this? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? And I find that a lot of cases is, uh, we use the word trust. No, trust, no. no. And all the words go around with trust. You have to look into this and be very careful. And also you said, you can't tell them too much. We used to go to the PUC meetings, we only answer the question, we often do that. Mm -hmm. Just answer the question, you go home. I'm sure that's a good idea to that. But I think the comprehensive plan has opened up so many doors and so many things. And I still refer to it. I get the books, this is the answer. Well, I took months to put it. He probably said when you worked on it. And it's uh, again more, more activity. And I, I get involved. This thing I think that brings the raw four time gym, the seniors do. It's intended for activities. However, our rule says activity and services. Anywhere from activities to, uh, to people who are changing their athletics. You know? So I just want to add those couple of cups out. So maybe you and I, I think Peter and I could sit, we're, we're planning on sitting down at some point in the next couple of weeks. Maybe you and I can brainstorm yep. different yep. places that it makes sense for, you know, we can start delegating groups to go out. Yep. And, and I know, you know, Facebook is sort of the, what did you say, 35 to 50 mm -hmm. age? But um, what if there was a way to do a Facebook Live where, you know, it then, Tells people who follow the town page. He's bouncing in a chair over there. <laughs> 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 I didn't say Twitter. I didn't say Twitter. Right? <laughs> um, but, but we're yeah. so close. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if there are different ways, so you know, I know the leader is for 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 we're saying that if you're 80 plus in this town, the leader is the place to be. So we somehow create the infograph or the information that then we put into the leader and then. Peter and I come up with some sort of yeah counselor school board plan, and then just if we're hitting it all the same message, but a variety of different ways, and it looks different based on the different media. So it, might. it sounds like we've got to get the messaging down first. I mean, all the venues are good, but we you know maybe a, a bulk of the first work needs to be getting our, our messaging in line. And, where we want to, what we want to communicate, and then we can talk about the how to communicate yeah. and yeah. all the cross-cutting. I, mean, I think we've got some great ideas.
some of the work you did is great to inform that. And as we move down through the rest of the agenda, maybe, I mean, so I think that's a great suggestion. So Jay and I will get together in the next week or so and, and kind of come back and have some stuff mapped out on that item. Yeah, I think that um, what would be really, really cool is once we decide what forms of media and what messages we're going to be sending and kind of then like plugging in like a matrix where and when it's going to happen so that community members can see it all in one spot and say, okay, I can't be at the coffee shop on Tuesday morning, but I can watch, you know, Channel 2 on this day or I can read the leader this week. So that way they can kind of customize how they get their information too. And I'm, I'm wondering if the community calendar or whatever that whatever we have is a good venue for that because that pulls in a lot of information. Yeah. You know, or we may even piggyback with that and say, okay, you know, uh, the library group is meeting on this day. There's going to be a counselor and a school board member there as well. We get, you know, if you want to go ask her, ask questions or whatever. You know, but but yeah, I think that that kind of community calendar might be a good place to kind of collect all that, and it, I think it might drive some views, if you will, towards that type of um, resource. I don't, I don't know what the, do we know how much access or how much that's being utilized? Setco uh, maintains it. They, they certainly have the analytics. They can tell us how many folks are, how many things it's here. Well, and to Larissa's point, maybe you take that same matrix and you publish it later. So that you, uh, absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If you're, yeah. you're, you're yeah. creating yeah. exactly. something yeah. that says, here are right. all the different ways you can get information, then you yeah. want to make sure that you... It's truly multimedia. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> we used to have open houses here in town. We had coffee and cooking. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Some people don't know we had a third floor. Right. Right. Uh, we could then they could ask questions. We had a cup of coffee. You could chat and talk about things. And we had the, the, the town manager and the school department council and the board member of the school board. And, and we had a lot of people who came in and asked us, oh, I didn't know this. Oh, I didn't know this. Thank you so much. And they really welcomed the opportunity to come. Invited to come to town. Rather <laughs> <laughs> than told you had to come to town and pay taxes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Jody, take away the new list, kind of jumping ahead, but we'll, we'll put something together. Um, the next kind of item on the agenda was new business. Does anybody have any of the four items listed? Anybody got one they want to tackle first? This is an aggressive agenda. Yes, it is. Sort of yes, it is. In. So I do think the budget forum format and details should be top of the list. I think we're going to change it up. Yes. <laughs> I, mean, I think if we go as we have the last couple of years, it's fairly that those right details will fall in place. But if you want to switch up the format, I think we need to start talking about that now. And can, I, I would like to suggest we move legislative update to number two then, because I think we've got some preliminary information that's not that's exactly so positive. So you're not yeah. And I think we need to start getting out ahead of that as well. Yeah, and I think that will inform the conversation we just had, what, what's going to be the topic, and what do we message, and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. So, so budget forum. Yeah, that's the best place to start. Um, as we've talked about before, it's come up that should we change up the format and should we um, come up with new ways to sort of, I don't know, spice up the budget form? If that's <laughs> possible. <possibly. laughs> um, I'm not wearing a skirt. I'm not wearing a skirt. <laughs> um, so we're open to hear what other people sort of think about the budget form and ways that it could be changed. The thing that we came up with seems like forever ago at it this does. point, uh, was sort of doing, formatting it so that people knew what they were getting at what time, versus saying, okay, from 7 to 9, we have a budget forum, how about we say from 7 to 7.30, we're going to focus on X, 7.30 to 8, the focus will be this, 8 to 8.30, just to sort of put a little bit of structure into that night, and it might allow people to come for a specific time if they aren't willing to commit for the full two hours. That's great. Might I suggest we're, we're a bit of preach to the choir here. I wonder, shouldn't we be engaging the consumers at that mm -hmm. event and understanding from them what worked and what didn't? With yeah. all due respect, I'm not right. sure this I, is the best group yes, to, to really well, know to know that. What right. if rather than having one one giant one from 7 to 9, 30, what if we had a series of two or three one-hour sessions that really were just kind of, you know, Q and A, topic or focused. either focused on a topic or, you know, once the budget's presented, have it have it be like, okay, you know, one session is cost drivers. It's a half an hour of, of 
whatever we're going to present there, and then a half an hour of Q and A or, or something, and have maybe multiple. Well, multiple we run times. into it was a challenge to get everybody, everyone there, and <coughs> reserving a spot that could televise it. I'm just thinking if we have one, you know, oftentimes I, I think we have one day and it's hit or miss. And it may not be people aren't coming because it's not necessarily a topic that they want to talk about. It's just their schedule doesn't give them that day doesn't work. So, you know, some kind of flexibility to be able to either accommodate multiple dates or find a way to break up that information or, or get it to them in another way. I don't know. And there's a very basic thing that many of our seniors don't drive at night. So if the target audience uh, is, it, yeah. that's, I mean, that's it's pretty simple, and we kind of tend to forget it because we're all still driving at night, um, but you're losing a large portion of the population as soon as the meeting goes till 8. And Bud just mentioned, what about a Saturday afternoon? You know, or you know, early Saturday afternoon or something yeah. like that? We do have the, the question of, of venue. In fact, we've already run into the fact that the high school's not available on the night that we want it, and we were going to do it at the public <coughs> gym. Or a cafetor and ace, <laughs> whatever the fake word is. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I completely agree with the two of you that you are excluding people who, um, not just seniors who don't drive at night, but parents with younger kids who are right. home putting right. them to bed. And there's, there's certainly demographics that you're saying come on Wednesday night and they're just going to say, no, can't do it. Other societies in town would walk him an opportunity to have you at their buildings. American Legion, American Zone, <coughs> uh, the, the uh, other agencies, we have the uh, Masonic Group, would love to have you come in and work in the room. And all these places have a little coffee shop, a cup of coffee, and a little bit of something. And I think, why don't we take advantage of those places? Why don't we have to come to The town hall is very convenient. Just one other thought. I I'm recalling last year, we had probably 75% or 80% of the questions come in in advance. Right. Mm -hmm. And we could still do that. We can invite questions, we can answer them, and post that for the masses to see at their convenience. Mm -hmm. uh, and I then, did bring copies of those, Tom, just in case right. people wanted paper copies. And then or really taking off on sort of the work that Larissa started, one other strategy is to to really make it formal and not have this big televised event where we tend to have all the resources on site and answer every question under the sun, but engage people six different times over the course of the budget process. And it's a collection of maybe folks around this table. We won't have all the answers, but you engage in a more in-depth and formal conversation and talk about what's on their mind rather than so, so what, 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 what if we kind of built up to the built up to the forum where we had a bunch of smaller teams kind of going out ahead of time saying, you know, we're we're going to hit on a topic or we're here for Q and A. And as the questions, if they become more detailed, we say, you know, listen, here's an opportunity. We're going to have a more in depth, uh, you know, uh, gathering or more detailed on the budget forum, or vice versa. We start kick off with the budget forum, with get all that information out there, see who shows up, and then take it on the road afterwards and say, okay, we're I don't know how much time we'll have between there, but to be able to break it up then and say, well, listen, here's the here's where the portal is, here's where the, all, all the information is. We, we can certainly have a you know some discussion about what we talked about, where the details are, where we're at. You know, but just kind of mix it up a little, kind of combine, almost combine the two a little bit to, to play off each other. I don't know what the, I mean, I don't know what the logistics would be because timing is always critical at this with, with this stuff. Mr. Turk, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I will. Do you have any opinions about how we can better engage folks? You know what we've done over the last couple of years in the forum? I do know. The, the one thing that keeps coming to my mind, and keeps coming up with the smart tax agreements, is that nobody knows what's going to happen with the school budget or the town budget until it's presented to the council. And then you get this massive document, and you have a choice of either reading your narrative or trying to weigh through line by line. And it keeps coming into my mind that we got a new president, and in a couple of weeks that he's been in that job, he's already told us in the last couple of days we're probably going to have this much defense and we're going to make it up by cutting so many programs here and there. But I uh, think important for us all is to get a pretty good idea of what this budget is going to look like. We're guessing a lot. 
I worry that I have to wade through the document that is provided by the town and the school and try to make some suggestions or even understand this massive document. Is there any way that we can find out? Surely you've got, you both have got a pretty good idea of the budget you're going to present by now. No, I don't. No. <laughs> Tomorrow's the deadline. I've not even seen my department request. I've got a sense, but I, I think it would be irresponsible there. Good. I understand your point. You'd like yeah. to know earlier, but yeah. I, I guess your, your point, I've heard it in other ways, is somewhat troubling to me. I mean, we have a representative democracy. We have a council and a board of education who's tasked with doing that on your behalf. Yet you feel the need to understand and cover it cover yourself. And I don't know how we're ever going to be able to meet all of those needs. I think we're doing a decent job of it, and, 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 and nothing's perfect, granted, but I mean, everybody gets the information when we get it as counselors and the finance committee meetings and things like that, so we're not, it's not like we're, um, I know the perception sometimes is that we're kind of hoarding information and assembling it and, you know, putting all the bells and whistles together and then throwing it out to the public. We're all funneling through the same information at the same time, so I mean, we've got, when, when it comes to finance, when it's ready, it's presented to us as early as it, as it can be through that process. So that we can engage that way. Um, you know, that's one way to kind of to, 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 to assemble all the big pieces together. But even, even between our two groups, we're, we're kind of doing two separate components um, and, and pulling them together because this, this, the work is, the amount of information and work that has to happen is, it's, as you know, it's, it's pretty cumbersome. It's big. I mean, they're, they're big budgets. So maybe there's a way that those budget um, info sessions or whatever it is, is working through that document with the public, sort of taking it section by section or, I don't know, key points of, it's but we, hard to, yeah. I mean, it's. But we do that, we do that in finance. We, we have department meetings <coughs> before the budget's approved. <coughs> We have department meetings where they sit down and they and they we, well, they walk us through all of the proposals, the proposed budgets, and before we deliberate and decide what the budget is. I mean, I think you guys do the same thing from financing, where you have the the, the joint leadership teams right. where you guys sit through and break down all the proposals and go through the process. Right. You exactly. know. So I think that's after the first reading, but there isn't anything to talk about until the first reading, which yeah, is strong. Well, well, that's what gets presented. Well, sure. yeah. what, what I was going to say is that I, I think what. Is what's important for what we need to work on communicating with our community is the immense complexity of developing these budgets. Um, so I'm going to speak just specifically to the school side, but know that you know it's kind of however many departments on the town side. Is the first job we have is to just look at our level services budget. So if we close the doors in June when the kids leave and we open them up as kids open them up in August when they come back, you know what are some of those those fixed costs that we know are going to go up every year, but are also going to be there every year. We have no choice in the matter. So that's like, that's phase one, is just kind of getting a handle on that. Meanwhile, while, while you know Kate is doing that kind of work, and we have the whole leadership team evaluating what were the investments we made last year, and how what, what are the gains that you're seeing from those investments, and then what are the next steps that we need to take, and that is, Big work. I mean, we've been doing this since we started back in December, okay. officially with the leadership team, and dividing that into like long sessions. So they're spending three, four hours at a time, really like working and looking at these things and hearing each other's proposals because we're a system and we have to, you know, at, and in that conversation determine. So what are the immediate needs? Like I like to say, what's the oxygen? What can we not live without? Um, and what are the other things that would enhance our programming? And then we have to come to, like, what can we really go to our community and say, this is it, like, these are the critical items that, that we need in order to maintain our school system um, in a way that's going to give our students the free and appropriate education that they have a constitutional right to, right? They have an actual, we have that obligation. And so that process is really, really detailed. And I want my leadership team to be super innovative in this middle piece here, in the second phase of that, and be thinking about all kinds of options. If you heard every idea that came up, I think that some people would be nervous about that. Some people would hear it and think that that's what we're saying we have to do. Um, and so there's lots of pushing back and forth, if you will, in a positive way to say, like, is that really the priority? Like, tell me why that's the priority. 
um, go back and think some more about it, and then come back to me again with a refined proposal. So there's, it's like a pulse, um, you know, and then our, our each department head and each phase leader is going back to their individual teams, and they're working on it collaboratively. So it's really, it's really complex, and I appreciate what I hear our community members saying because, you know, we have all this time with it, and we get to be really close to it um, inside the school department. And then we're saying, well, so how do you tell this story in a way that's not filled with a bunch of educational jargon, that's not bogged down with, you know, all of the ins and outs of our professional needs, but also um, helps the community understand why this is why this is an important investment. So it's, I mean, I don't have it figured out yet, but I'm still working on it. Um, but what I was saying earlier to Tom is that the way I'm feeling about it right now um, in my first year as the superintendent <coughs> and trying to bring, take in all of that information is, you know, here's our mission. And that hasn't changed. We have a, a moral and ethical obligation to our students to ensure that they get the very best possible education they can have so they can reach their full potential, so they can become good, you know, productive citizens, right? We all, everyone in our community has um, a, a stake in that, if you will. But then it's like a force field coming in all around us. So we have, um, you know, an aging community that's growing faster than our um, school age community. And they have, you know, budgetary constraints individually. We have the, um, the governor's biannual budget that's saying, do more with less. We have, you know, young families who are saying, we want the school to provide all of these things within the six hours and 25 minutes that you have them. And so there's all these levers that are pushing in on that. And trying to, for me, I'm trying to hear all of that and, and, and use that information as we're making our priorities so that we come out with, at the end, um, a budget that is fiscally responsible, but that still is innovative and is going to guarantee that our kids get that education that they need. And so, I, I hear what you're saying about like what are some of the predictable things that we think might be coming, um, but I, I just I guess I'm still struggling with like how how do you get that just enough information so that it doesn't. Get the one thing I should say, just we came up with this new budget format, 400 pages. I'd be quite proud of it. Um, mm -hmm. But it wasn't the budget that most people were interested in. It was a one-page infographic that Karen Martin put together the day of my presentation. Mm -hmm. So I think that. Your points were well yeah. 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 for how many months yeah. and yeah. how many months and then that, that that is the, the lesson there is that and yeah. from the first moment I met with the Smart Tax Group, uh, their mission was all about uh, providing information in consumable packets so that people understand what's going on. And then that's what it's, that's they don't what need the deep dive of a four hundred page document. They need a one or two pager that says yeah. This is the stuff that's driving us, or this is the stuff. But we, that we but we need those details to make those informed, educated decisions. Fair enough. But I think coming up with a, uh, a simple way to communicate the high points right. is a piece that uh, is that's a legitimate criticism. Okay. Okay. So, so but the, the, I guess my question is, have is, is the concern with the budget process itself, or is it concern with the decisions that are made in that process, or a combination of the two? I don't want to speak for everybody, but. I would say that the concern is not the process, because the process is something that we have to work on yourself. But uh, things like ATVs and principles, for example, but the uh, city's going to raise defense spending, cut social programs, and we billion dollar figures. And then he said national security and homeland security are big things, and yet he cut a Coast Guard cutter that was going to be used for our homeland security. So, you know, that's got a lot of people asking questions. And it's just those kind of things that I was looking for, and <coughs> you probably are correct when you say that you've got that one page document the but the president hasn't told us how he's going to pay for it. So, I mean, you know, it, I don't know what purpose that serves by sending half a message out. Well, and I guess my concern would be, you know, it, it, do, 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 is there value, the, I think what I'm trying to grasp is, is there value in having as much information and as details as we know that we can compile by a certain date, which is kind of how the process is driven now, 
And then, and so we know that when when we put a statement out as a group, we know that it's based on hard data and hard information. The decision might not be the one that everybody agrees with, but we at least have the data to back up why we made that decision. Versus coming out of the gate in the January or you know this month and saying, you know, we've got a kind of concept of where we're at. Um, you know, and we think we're going to, you know, we want to improve uh, the access to seniors somewhere. If if that without any details or any information behind that, my concern would be that people would jump on that and say either they like that idea and, and they're for it, or they don't like that idea, even before we've kind of roughed it out and, and it's gone through the process where that, that another priority may come up that supersedes that. So it's, it's, instead of being like totally reactionary to everything that's going on, um, I think that, you know, as no process is perfect, but I think part of that trust thing to me is that We've got the information. We've got. We all see the same information, and we all are working off the same page. And and we've spent hours as a group collectively going through priorities. And there's a process that we go through so that what comes out the back end um, is thought out and 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 meaningful. It may not be agreed to. The priorities might be different for some people. And that's I think where that that discussion needs to come in is why is the priority being put here? Not so much. You know, um, we think this much is too much here, or we think this is. It's, it's how are we establishing these priorities? And I, I like the 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 concept is if, if we can if we can start talking about where we're going to be in three years or five years, that's what I'm hoping we get to with this process. We shouldn't. The budget should almost be kind of automatic at this point, where we we we're not so much reacting to what's going on in a year to year basis, but we're proact proactively going. We know in three years. This is where it might be, or where it could be. So here's our plan A, plan B, plan C, and we're being a little bit more forward-looking. I don't know if we can achieve that um, because of the the, the uh, inconsistencies with this with state funding and, and funding levels and things like that. But to get as close as, as we can, that was one of our goals was to have predictable and sustainable budgets. And 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 so so I mean I I'm trying to struggle with how do we get both of those the best of both worlds. You know what I mean? I think, you know, as we talk about the budget forum, which, you know, kind of bring it in a yeah. <laughs> circle um, to where you want to go, but I think, I think we've heard a couple things which we can learn from. I mean, I, you know, you, you shared earlier that people, how do you take the 400 pages and put it into something meaningful? Sounds like you're sort of there in the same time. You know, how do we, how do we communicate what we're trying to do? And I think a good example is when you distributed something about the teacher's con I mean, that, that was an attempt to take something really complicated you kind of boiled it down into some things we could understand. So that's something we can all take away. I think that's part of what we want to talk about. And Tom, the only question I had for you when you said we should ask our audience, do we know who the audience, I mean, do we have a way that we can Flight poll them? Or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, exactly. That was yes. that. Yes. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. 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 I'm just not sure if this group gets good feedback on that. Uh, I think right. it's a great idea if we could do that. I mean, completely. Right, we end up talking sort of in circles. I think I just worry about timing at this point. I mean, we're March 2nd. I know. And so I wonder if the ideas that we've sort of come up with on these first two items that we've talked about being maybe we keep the budget form the way it is now, and that's the, the grand event. But along the way, whether that's the starting point, the kickoff, and <coughs> following that is the smaller breakout events. Right. I hate to call them events. Roadshow. Roadshow. Road um, to sort of dive deeper if people are interested. Yeah. So how many, how many like the idea of the, I mean, to stay with your concept about the budget form, sort of where it is, I think questions in advance is great like we've done. Maybe try to structure that a little bit differently within. I like your idea about sort of the different time frames. If we could do that, and take a look at it. And then, how many like the idea of a follow-up roadshow? Is that something we could commit to? We think it's a good show at the end. Well, I mean, I'm not saying five times a week. No, 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 no. I think a couple, 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 
Well, but, but if, we divide, if we divide it up into teams, I mean, uh, you know, the, the more hands make light work, right? I mean, it doesn't mean that all of us have to connect every single day. Right. You know, if we know, you know, if we're in teams of two, let's say, and, and you know, we know we've got one day a week to go off, we can divide and conquer, you know, as long as the messaging is the, is the same. You know? I'm just wondering if we could commit to doing two or three of those before the budget form as, like, a yeah. way to say to people, hey, also come to this event and tell yeah. your friends and tell your neighbors. And okay. then, you know, afterwards there may be an opportunity to say, anyone who didn't get to come, we're still going to be out and about talking about the budget. Are so we just thinking about the span of time in between the first reading and the forum? Or are we thinking about from now until the forum? I mean, from now, what we could talk about is the sort of thing that Julie just described. What's actually mm -hmm. happening right now mm -hmm. um, in school or in the town? Right. What's the, the process, process that's happening? And I couldn't tell you. Like, I, I'm just a school board member and a parent. I don't know what those meetings that you're having with your staff are, but I know they're happening. And I could answer that sort of question. So, but after the first reading, we can get more specific. So, I think you would also want to be very clear to people what the purpose of these forms are. So, what I'm hearing is a disconnect is people that wish, and I didn't understand this until Tom mentioned about representative government, and he's right. I think that the disconnect is people that may think that they, people that wish to have say in the numbers that are put forward, and there being a misunderstanding that that's not the form of government we have. And I think that when you're, if you're going to be having these intimate conversations, these smaller group conversations, it needs to be very clear to people why you're having them. That, that you're not having them to gain ideas from them about how they think the money should be spent. That's, I don't think, the purpose of this particular exercise. Because that, I think, is heading in a direction that becomes unruly very quickly. Um, people should feel free to call their or stop in to visit their elected representative government officials and say, I really don't like how much money we're spending on the assistant town manager. I really wish that you would have changed that position to be a part-time place. They should feel welcome to do that. But I don't think that that's what I'm understanding from you. You would like to have these, these um, engagement sessions be about. And so if I'm understanding you correctly, then I think that that message needs to be communicated clearly. Because I think I am hearing that there is interest in being engaged pre-budget release because they wish to have more say in what that budget looks like. Does that make sense? It, it does. I think, I, I, again, I think it's what our goals are, right? So if, we, if we're going to talk details and, and, to Bud's point, stay on task and just answer questions and concerns, we almost have to go post first reading because we don't have the data and the information until that first reading comes out, even if it's preliminary. Um, but if we wanted to work towards building the trust or, or getting that buy-in or trying to build that participation, that might be what the first couple of meetings are. You know, hey, it's more like what we've tried to do before. Here's our process. Here's where we are in the process. You know, we're starting this discussion. We may not have all the details for you right now, but, but, but we're going to have a budget form, and then we're going to take it on the road afterwards. So get engaged. Now's the time to get engaged with those that, that, in, that commitment to, to show up and start paying attention. Maybe that's what we use the first couple of that meetings prior to, the, prior to the kickoff ask. Because I also think having the road show after helps guide those road shows to be like, oh, you're asking about X. Well, here, so when we talked about it at the budget forum, here's what was asked, and, and it's similar to what you're asking. And then you can go into the, it sort of provides for the group, whoever's there, uh, uh, guidelines along the way of, of questions or ideas or other concerns that people might have that you can sort of have that discussion around. Or how to read the budget book on the topic you're interested in, where yeah. to find it. And, oh, yeah, that information is actually here if you look on right. page 412. So, you know, which comes down to communications, you've got to be careful with communications. I'm increasingly of the opinion that the forum is it's pageantry, it's a lot of show with not much value. Uh, I think we can accomplish largely what we need to by accepting uh, online or email questions and providing answers for urgency. And those that ask those detailed questions are going to find the answer. A lot of folks, I don't think, are really interested in that level of depth. Yeah, but I also think that that provides that kind of town hall, that town meeting feel to it that, that you know, I, 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 I'm it's not ready to, to throw the whole thing. Talking heads. I, I don't think it's a very interactive process at all. That's my impression. And I looked back at the questions that Kate sent us. <laughs> In 2016, we had 75 total questions. 
Right. Um, in 2017, no, is that right? It's, it's for the 2016 budget. Thank so you. All of a sudden, I'm like, wait, we're So for the 2017 budget, we only had 39. And of those, there were many repeat sort of um, questions. There were probably about 20 people for questions or something like that. Yeah. Right. Uh, but I really think that the time, the effort on the more personal level, engaging people where they are, talking about what they want to talk about, and sometimes it's them telling us how they think we should be spending money, that's fine. If that's what they want to say, I think we need to perceive that. But that building trust in doing so, I think, is... What if, what, if, what if we what if we we went through the process again this year, right? And and that's part of the survey. You know, uh, is, is this was this process helpful? You know, is this is do you have is there value in, in continuing the the budget dialogue process the way that it is, or would you like to see them? I and that's another opportunity right. for, for survey feedback. Let us come up with a, a simple, you know, maybe surround this conversation with some outside input. And so maybe in terms of you. Maybe United. So far, in our kind of the takeaways to do. Yes. Why don't we mean come up with some type of plan or recommendation for the communication portal and the budget forum based on some of that, and move it back to this week, probably between meetings, just to see if that makes any sense. Okay. Kind of take a lot of this input and kind of go from there. I think the intent of the budget forum the first time we did it was to show that we are trying to make ourselves available to answer questions. We don't want things to be opaque and weird and, and, and difficult. Um, but I agree that because we made it sort of formal and big and important and, and sort of, you know, here we all are in our panel, that like to Tom's point, it's not very flexible and it's not very responsive. So again, you lose that dialogue piece. Yeah. Everybody good? Second. Okay. Um, and I think the suggestion was the legislative update would be the next sort of conversation. I don't know. <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> what is all looking at that? Well, yeah, you're all, you're all looking at me. Um, yeah. I think what we should say is that there's a new governor's biennial budget out there, and there are going to be some folks here at the table that can speak to what that looks like. Um, the piece, of course, that we're most interested in my office is the um, state subsidy for schools. And I have some documents and some information to share on that. I, I think Julie might want to say something because she's on her way to Augusta tomorrow to testify on this topic. Um, do you want me to share some details first? And then yeah. The, uh, this kind of this kind of goes to what uh, Mr. Turk was asking for. Sort of what do we already know? We already know that in the biennial budget um, proposal, the governor has made 48 changes to the EPS formula, which is not how she to, to the actual yeah. formula, which yeah. is not um, how it's supposed to be done. But what the the short answer to that is that it looks like, based on those proposed changes, that the number would receive. Coming. So we were just hoping it would take a little bit longer, but um. Um, so I've, I've handed out this document, which I don't anticipate you all sit here and read because it's more background information. So I'll speak it to you a little bit. Um, what we wanted to touch on was the, the changes that are in the governor's budget, as Julie said, um, are sort of controversial in that what he's saying in his budget proposal is let's rewrite the EPS formula, which is the formula by which you decide how much is needed their programs. Um, so one of the things that Julie and a lot of her colleagues are going up to speak about to the legislature is why are you doing it through this method? I mean, you, if you want to rewrite the EPS formula, we've been talking about it for years. You have a high paid consultant come in um, that you, you know, creates all kinds of great pathways and guidelines for you to change this legislatively. You decide it's fine, and then the governor's budget is going to be the, the method by which you 
decide to change it after all. So there's some weirdness there. Um, the, the problem in our situation is that even if all of the strange and bizarre things that are part of this calculation don't make it through the legislature, because they would have to, um, this EPS formula is in statute, we still are in the same boat that Chris is referring to, that you know, years, years gone by now, we've been talking about the trajectory of loss of subsidy, and I'll actually pass this one around if you want to take one and pass it down. You've all seen something like this before. It's a chart that shows the change in state subsidy for schools um, from 2009 through the current proposed. And uh, we were talking with Larissa yesterday. She's actually got some documents that show that adjusted with inflation. This doesn't. It's just um, straight numbers. But, but it does. It tells the tale that we've been um, slowly losing support from the state, as you guys all know heard the story many times before. Um, and so the way that the formula works out right now, the Department of Education has taken the governor's proposed budget, budget with the changes in the EPS formula and has said, OK, you guys really need us to give you a subsidy calculation. First, they said, we can't do it. Sorry, we can't help you. So I think we talked about that at our last meeting. Well, we're not going to get numbers from the state. Well. Yeah. A couple weeks ago, they said, yeah, sure, we'll give you the numbers. We'll just give you the numbers based on the proposal that's sitting out there on the table, and we all know that that's probably not going to be the final proposal. Um, when you look at Scarborough's, Scarborough's calculations, there's a number of things that they take out of the formula and basically assume that we need less money to run our schools than ever before, uh, which we can all debate that. Um, but because Scarborough's valuation can continues to be higher in comparison with other school districts in Maine because our student count is either reducing or staying flat compared with other districts in Maine. And those are based on three prior years of student growth. So no matter what happens in the next couple of years, it takes time to catch up. Because of all of that, we are at minimum receivership in this calculation. And so um, this document sort of explains a little bit about what minimum receivership is. There's a statute that says school districts in the state of Maine can't get less money from the state than, and there's two scenarios by which they can calculate it. One scenario is based on the number of pupils you have and, and the per pupil calculation. It's the greater of the two. So it's either that or it's a percentage of your special education spending in the prior year. And for us, the special education spending is the number that, that creates the calculation. So um, I actually have another spreadsheet thing here that I can share around too, but some of the calculations that we made. If we um, work our way through the EPS formula and we get down to the bottom and we figure out how much the state thinks we need to spend to run K-12 education in Scarborough. And then we take the Scarborough valuation and the mill rate and all the things that calculate what the local share should be. We actually come in under the minimum amount of what the subsidy would be that they gave us. So they went back and said, okay, well, I guess now your minimum receivers, we're going to give you Per the governor's budget, we're going to give you 33% of what your special education costs were in 2016. And that's where we get this 2.150 million um, subsidy amount. Okay, how many other towns or districts are minimum receivers? I don't know the answer to that. I know there are that. Um, there, there really aren't that many, and they're sort of an odd collection. Um, it really depends on the person proportion and valuation, but I know, Chris, you did that little bit of a study a couple of years ago. I thought they were predominantly in Cumberland and York County, but I could be wrong. I thought they were mostly coastal Cumberland and York County towns that were, that was there already. I think the ones that are minimum receiver yeah. are coastal. I don't know how many new ones. But, yeah. but not most of Cumberland County. No, 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 no. That's no, 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 no. Like oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Like, no, they're no. not. No. Okay. No. I don't really know the answer to that. I mean, I'd have to sort of look at the individual 279, which is the, the spreadsheet they use, and or I'm sure it's probably posted somewhere in the DOE's data. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. As superintendents, we've been looking at what does this what does this proposed budget kind of mean in dollars from FY17 to FY18, and so it ranges from some communities 
actually receiving an increase to some losing even more than what Scarborough would be receiving. So um, it's, it doesn't necessarily make a whole lot of sense the way that it's being done. And so I'm hopeful that there will be better things coming out shortly. But right now, that's that's the figure that we're using to kind of plan. Um, and there's, I think that's another part that makes it hard to kind of get that rolling information is that there are a lot of unknowns that we just don't have yet. Moving pieces. So the, um, you know, a couple of things to think about with this outcome. First of all, as Julie said, it's not, um, it's not going to last this way because I don't think the legislature is going to be on board with making all of these changes in this way, I think they're gonna to wanna to have a more thoughtful approach to the EPS formula. Um, that said, unless the legislature decides to actually give more money to education, and make the pot bigger, then Scarborough really isn't gonna make out all that well. And you know, we have that sort of little talking point floating out there in the public of the referendum that passed that said that we're going to tax the highest earners in the state of Maine, and we're gonna increase the income tax, and we're gonna use that money for education which is a lovely concept, but the, the biennial budget also proposes tax decreases for those income levels that would offset that. And even if that did continue to be um, a way to raise revenue for education, it wouldn't be so for several years because we haven't collected those taxes yet and we haven't determined that those taxes are even going to be collected yet. <coughs> so our plan is to plug in the 2.15 million to our budget and at first reading we'll be rolling it out with that. Um, the, the nice thing, if there's a nice thing about this, is that it can't get worse. Um, I, I, we, thanks. Not, we, not, 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 <laughs> oh, it makes us feel better. No, but we've talked about right. this. Exactly That's what Chris right. said. Right. You, once you get to minimum receivership, provided they don't completely dismantle the minimum receivership statutes, which is always possible, we are going to get a percentage of our special ed costs, which continue to rise year over year. We might actually see more subsidy next year. And that would be the, the way that we would translate that. Well, not to take away your only shining hope, but um, <laughs> my understanding of the, the proposals regarding the EPS formula, though, is the danger is not is that they're, tr so they're supposed to be 55%, they never have, and they're continuing to shrink the size of the, of the services that the 55% covers. Right. Right. So there's still loss to be had. Oh, there's so, plenty of opportunity. And, and the, the special ed um, formula is one of those places. So instead of it being like 1.5, or I can't remember the exact figures, but mm -hmm. that that's one of the things that they're looking at shifting. So even if they don't change the statute regarding minimal receivership, if they change the way that that's calculated, then this then Scarborough is still in that position. So don't get too comfortable with your with your the other thing that they can do is actually if you look at the statute around minimum receivership, it has actually specified percentages year after year of you know, you will receive thirty percent of your special ed cost from the prior year, you will receive twenty seven, you will receive thirty three. It's only in the governor's proposal that it's 33. In statute right now, it's 30. So, I mean, there's definitely room for them to mess around with that. Um, but I think that we're talking a pretty low baseline, and I think the idea that there would be legislative will to reduce that significantly, um, I hope that, that that's not really the case. Um, there's one other shining light in this, which is that and I, I wrote it in my memo to you guys that, that uh, last year when we found that we had unspent Wentworth project funds that we needed to spend on debt service, we deliberately in this group and with the administrative team said we need to spend those on debt service, we need to create fund balance in 2016. We ended 2016 with a $2.2 million fund balance, yeah. which we knew was going to be available to us in the ensuing budget years to use as revenue to offset this loss. So had we not had that opportunity or had we not had that you know, choice to make and made that choice, we would be in a much more difficult position. Um, so again, you know, that's a little bit of a, a silver lining. Um, and I think to Chris's point, I think that you know, we, 
can be more predictable. We can we cannot be looking forward to another million dollar loss, another million dollar loss. And even if they took it down to zero, that's just two more years or a year and a half <laughs> by the time they get there. So I think I think philosophically we kind of used the analogy before of the you know the planes crashing, right? So we're landing in the Hudson. You know, um, do we, we we've got just enough to keep our nose up so that we don't we don't pitch pole in, but we're still going down. And I, I think um, maybe what we've got to do philosophically, and you know, I, hopefully that's one of the purposes of this of this group is to decide, you know, how are we going to approach that system systemically? Are we going to, you know, I mean, we've got a mechanism in place for for this year. You know, do we want to start looking at? Um, longer term planning to say, okay, we're just going to assume that that's minimal receivership. We're going to be that way moving forward. If something else comes in, how do we, you know, if, if we get lucky enough and, and, and that subsidy does increase, do we put it in this year's revenue? Do we put it back into the fund? Do we rely on that next year? How, you know, and I think those are the kind of philosophical discussions that maybe we should be having. Not so much the details of what we're going to do with it and how we're going to do it, but, you know, from a general perspective of where. Where, so are we, where are we going to go with this? And what, what you're saying, I think, is that we won't really know where we're going to land. You know, we, we'll make this assumption that this is, you know, we hope the worst case scenario for 2018, but by the time we pass our budget, we may well not know. And, you know, maybe we get $3 million instead of 2.1. Wouldn't that be lovely? Right. So we, what you're saying is we need to be planful about that. Right. Well, and two words that you'll hear in the in our school budget presentation as we finalize our numbers and, and how we how we tell the our explain our needs to the public are gonna be restructuring and reallocation. So we've already we've already started looking at that and saying, you know, what are the immediate needs of our organization? Um, remember that mission that's in the center of it and how can we rethink how we use our existing resources so that we can continue to grow um, and improve but can also be mindful of the burden that it is for our taxpayers and, and the loss of subsidy that we're projected to get. So I think that that's an important message for the community to, to be aware of, is that we're trying to be so strategic and thoughtful about how we're using our existing resources. So. I think, Chris, I think you're right. I mean, the real question will become, you know, to share with this group that the, the town council did adopt its goals last night. And still within that goals is trying to have a sustainable sort of tax increase going forward of no more than three percent. So I think this impact, we will have to have those conversations and, and the Whitworth fund, okay, if we use it all this year, right. next year will be a bump. And right. so at some point we need to, as we get further down the budget process, really think about the total budget of the town. And we're going to talk about cost drivers in, in a second, so I have no idea what's on the town side or what your other budget stuff is coming in at, because this is just the funding side. You right. still have the whole right, right. investment side and planning side. But I think we start to frame up now what our talking points are going to be. We're going to we're going to have to carry do some heavy lifting to communicate what this means and what we're doing and what that's going to mean from from the sustainability and, and what that means going forward. And, and short term yes. and long term. Yes. Yes. Well, and yes. we're talking about, you know, hopefully bottoming out and then beginning to stabilize and Yeah. I mean and, and then we right. well I guess that something I said in the memo was we, we actually get to make fiscal policy here in Scarborough instead of waiting for the state to tell us what our fiscal right. policy is, which I think is critical. Um, I was wondering if anybody knew anything about the municipal revenue sharing piece. <coughs> I don't see it's going to make it, take a major hit from, from current year. That would be nice. I think the governor's proposal actually keeps it. It's Very supposed nice to. Well. We already took a hit. Uh, right. The governor's proposal is to keep it where it's at. It was supposed to go back to where it was. Mm -hmm. so, so the good news is we're not going to see any, any less, but we're certainly not going to see any more. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and of course, in the back of my mind too, as we get further down the road, this question of where do we budget for evaluation here in Scarborough and. Well, I think the positive, the positive side is we, we've adopted a few mechanisms to give us some guidance along the projections for, for evaluation, right? I mean, we've, so we can, we can plug, kind of backwards plug in that, where we assume, and of course, you know, obviously our, I think, you know, it's a question of how conservative do we want to be. Um, you know, we always hope, hope for the best, but plan for the worst. Um, so I think we can get a, a good range of where, what kind of revenue expectations 
we, we might see coming in and, and at least be able to have those discussions of, okay, you know, obviously it's a, it's a, it's a double-edged sword, right? The, the, the state penalizes us for positive valuation growth, but the positive valuation growth allows us to have a larger tax base. So it's, it is kind of, I mean, it's, in essence, it's cost shifting, which, which has been the, the goal for a while for the state. But I, but I think we can have those, you know, um, again, we do not like what we have to do and what we, what right. we see, we but there's mechanisms in place that I think that we can predict it. We can predict it, that's yeah. right. how you solve our solution set. Right. So, so if I hear you right, there's about, a, I mean, am I, am I off to say there's a pretty high confidence level that there's a significant adjustment coming our way, this is what I'm hearing, right? The, the number's not precisely 1.4 million, but it's going to be in that ballpark or yeah, and, it, yeah. and I think that the difficulty is going to be that unless there's some really um, clear communication from Augusta that says, you know, the legislature is just, you know, so excited about this and we're definitely putting in an extra billion dollars into the pool, you know, I'm not sure we're going to hear enough to know yeah. to plan for anything different. And so it's going to be, we are able to get more money to support the school budget, then you start thinking about, okay, well, maybe you don't need to use as much fund balance, or you don't need to, you know, offset that with other revenues, so. Or if revenue does come in, it goes to fund balance, and it's available for the next cycle. Yeah. Right, well, right, you know. which is essentially yeah. what would happen anyway. If you have unplanned revenue on the school side, you don't get to spend it because your expenditure budget is already set and right. voted and done. So you can't just, unless you go back to the voters and say we want to spend it on something, which we would typically do. So I guess the next the next item was sort of budget drivers, and so just to Tom, I know you you're collecting data; it's not all in yet. Is it? I mean, do you do you think we'll be close to the three percent overall for the Minnesota side? Yeah, the area new investments I anticipate is a continuation of the staffing plan or the that we started for the fire department. Police is not bringing forward requesting any new positions this year for fire similar to what they had for the last five years, so there's no different. But beyond that, I don't see any major new investments in this. I want, I want to be clear, though. We're not talking about a 3% increase on expenditures. We're talking about a 3% okay. increase on the tax increase, not expenditure side of things. So, and, and that's... Well, right, 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 yeah, right, right. But, but okay. I mean, they're, they're sort of related. I mean, it's... They are, but when you talk about the dollar values, I mean, yeah, three percent increase in the tax base is is a, 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 a much similar. higher dollar value yeah, than a three percent reduction or a three percent yeah, operational revenue. But just knowing what the expenditure side <laughs> is then allows us to kind of just yes. as you said, once we, we we kind of can anticipate what the revenue side is going to be, right, right? Then we know where we are, right? And so yeah, I just, what, the words yeah. matter, though. Yeah, yeah, no, no, we had, I, no, no. You know, we had, we had that, we had yeah. some challenges. Well, I guess the other two things that. I would say is I don't expect we'll see an increase in the excise as we did last year. We saw a flat. big bump. We went yeah. six or seven hundred thousand dollars more. Well, I was just going to say that excise revenues are still positively trending. <laughs> so, but we're going to run out of budget at some point. Seven hundred thousand new not. New non property tax revenue is right. uh, you're not going to see something at that level of yeah, magnitude. Right, sure, right. Yes. That's sustainable. Yeah, right. And we've got some large, high value capital items coming forward. Uh, nothing new, they're in the pipeline. The yeah. Guam Road project is moving toward construction phase, um, East Grand Avenue with that equipment replacement. So, that'll, uh, that'll be next, next budget cycle or another cycle? Uh, uh, Guam Road's phase one construction is next budget cycle. Oh, th this side of it. Yeah, this first phase yeah. up to the yeah. Labrador. Yeah. But then I've heard that there are some um, capital equipment purchases, vehicle purchases that are probably going to be put in this budget. Public Works has kind of said these are. It's time. It's time, and it's yeah. costing the town more yeah. mm. maintenance wise. Well, than on the capital too. side, right? Or on the It'll be in the capital operation. equipment budget. Yeah, and it's consistent with our equipment replacement schedule. It's not, yeah. nothing new, it's just how the cycle falls. Um, I met with Mike this week and we talked about maybe pushing some of those out a year or two if we can. Um, but it comes down to if they're starting to cost us uh, in order to our maintenance, then it actually. makes sense to switch them out. Yeah. So yeah. Um, those are the, the cost drivers that I'm aware of right now. And I, I don't think there's any other big surprises out there. Nothing extraordinary for us. I mean, these are sort of, as you suggested, they're sort of the normal. Yeah, exactly. Well, what about the, um, the and I know it's not, I mean, we haven't, we're thinking of moving in that direction. We had some rough numbers for light replacement, LED light replacement. I mean, that's, that's not a huge number, but. That's in capital. Okay. Um, and 
I think it is going to be teed up as soon as next year. With yeah. it. It's not it's discretionary. We can choose yeah. to put that off a year. Yeah. Yeah. But that has a quick uh, return on investment right. in less than four years. So. Right. We've seen some great gains on the school side. Right. With, uh, with some of the bigger places we've used. So. Yeah. <coughs> so on, on the school side, have you guys got any um, of the expenditures? We are sort of, as, as Tom says, gathering information. We're yeah. putting together our level services budget. We should have it done by the next meeting that this group gets together. Um, and um, we're also, as Julie said, we've been going along talking about you know, what are the incremental investments that we would need to make to keep moving forward. The big cost drivers are going to be ones that you've heard me talk about a few many million times before. Um, Anthem benefits, we're budgeting at um, a 5%, 5.5% increase which is an average of the last four years. Last year we got nailed. Yeah. Last year we had an 8% increase. So I'm being super conservative yeah. in what I'm budgeting. Yeah. <laughs> last year it was 8.1. The year before that it was almost nothing. It was like 0.1. Well, that's, 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 that's projected. That's not actual. We'll, we yeah, yeah, actual, yeah, we'll yeah, get yeah, actual yeah. before the final budget. But, yeah. it, but We'll have to adjust the budget. Right. So again, cost drivers, unknowns for us. Um, Anthem, uh, actual premiums will come in in March. Delta Dental is a smaller package and come in in March as well. Um, workers Comp, um, our mod rate is not great. We had a couple of nasty, small uh, quantity, but nasty accidents last year. So that's going to shift a little bit, but not a huge amount. Um, we have the teacher's bargaining unit, which you've all heard the analysis of that. So there's, that's the sort of second year of that. Um, Are there got, any other contracts coming up this year? Yeah, we've got two unbargained <coughs> units right now. We have um, the school support staff, which is ed tech, secretaries, um, bus aides, folks at, and in that uh, support group, and the bus drivers are both in negotiations right now. The bus drivers are actively negotiating. The support staff have reached out to start setting some dates. So their contracts expire at the end of this school year, and so we have to budget. In, in those cases, as you know, we have to sort of budget a guesstimate as to what we might need to engage in good faith, good faith bargaining, and so those things can be refined as we go along through the process. But that's a sm um, relatively small percentage of the overall. It's one of the teacher contract is the huge. The one. teacher contract is right. the huge one. Um, the bus driver contract. Seventy percent of the budget. More than that, I think. Seventy-five percent of the budget is people. Yeah, yeah. So, so you must have a good sense. So you think? I mean, what's 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 the? I mean, is it is it in the three to five percent expenditure range? Is it in the five? Oh, to for for our overall. Overall. I think five. it'll be in the five percent range, which is what it was last year. It was five point five one percent when we came out at the end last year, and that translated down to uh, two point eight percent increase. But that's your level services budget, correct? Um, no, that was the overall budget last year, but I'm talking about level services right now. I think the incremental investments that we'll be able to make are going to be in you know, a couple hundred thousand, three hundred thousand, maybe. Same as the point seven percent of the overall budget. So, um, so there's six percent, right? Oh no, no. I mean, we're going to try and keep it under six. Overall. Of that, of that five percent, point seven, point zero, something is going to be for. Oh, that's in the. Yeah. It's in yes. that. Yes. It's yes. in that number. It's yes. in that. It's not addition to. It's typically, kind of typically. I mean, you're, sure you're writing down numbers, yeah. though, and I'm not giving you real. Numbers. No, no, no. But I mean, I, I think to, to kind of inform this group. Right. So now, yeah. you know, if if the municipal side of the budget's three-ish, let's just say, and you know, you're five-ish, yeah. then we can do some math. Exactly. Sure. And then or we can factor in the funding shortfall. Right, and how much of the fund yeah. balance are we willing to use? Right, where we need to go to get where we need and, to. And so we can start having that yeah. conversation Absolutely. about, right. as, as we talked about what we want to talk about. Yeah. I mean, it seems like we those really are the need, to, we need to talk about. Those are the, and they're complex. Yeah. Well, so and, the school funding I, thing is just really complex. So yeah, that, that, that gives us an opportunity that we can kind of build that communication bridge. Yeah. Sorry, There's one talking. other big piece um, that's floating out there. There are a couple of other things. Well, actually, I'll, I'll say two things. One is that um, you probably remember last year and the year before we talked about instructional technology and how we have the annual tech refresh yeah. at each phase. And it's on a four-year cycle and yada yada. And the, um, the high school laptops was a big 
push and uh, a large change in our program. But even going forward, we've always had at least half a million dollars or so in our CIP budget for tech refreshes. And over the past two years, we've moved about 200,000 of that into the operating budget. Mm -hmm. Next year, the plan was to move another 100,000 into operating. And right now, we're saying in level services, we probably will try to move another 100,000. That's negotiable. You know, that's a, it's a long range plan. It makes sense from a fiscal perspective that things that are replaceable in a short cycle belong in operating and not in CIP. But that's a talking point that we should should think about. And the other piece that's back to personnel costs is that um, the Main State Retirement folks have told us that um, you remember a few years ago they decided that local districts should start paying a share of um, retirement costs for the teachers, the teacher members. And it's um, at the time I described it as being not unreasonable in that if you work at the Hannaford your employer pays the same social security cost as you do. You put in 6.2% of your employer puts in 6.2%. In the good old days, the teachers put in 7.65% and the school department put in nothing because the state was picking up that employer side. So I don't disagree that it's a you know it's okay for employers to be charged that extra cost. Um, the difficulty is that it's not been predictable, it's been scattershot, there's been no clear strategic plan to say why they're doing the shift from the state to the local, how much they anticipate that being, when is it going to change. So they first sent us 2.6%. I have to look back now. I used to have that number in my head. It's been driven out by other numbers. <laughs> um, they, they sent us a bill for 2.6% in the first round. And then that they left that stable for two years. And then um, last year they said, well, now, now we need 336 this year they've said that it, they need to make another 18% increase in that obligation to the local communities, which translates to about 3.8, 3.9%. So again, you know, sort of creeping up, again, shifting costs down to the local communities, uh, away from the state. And the beautiful part of it is that they don't have any real numbers for us yet. It's just sort of a get ready, because this is going to happen. And we don't really know when those numbers are going to come through. So um, my business manager colleagues around the state are just sort of saying, okay, 18%, that would be this. We'll plug that in and hope for the best. So so two questions. Um, is, is the MLTI program disappearing for oh, middle school? Yeah, that's, that's yeah. another good topic. Okay. So that was a very good before that, before that one, are, are, they're also trying, the state's trying to shift administrative costs down to the local level too, right? This uh, part of this, uh, to answer your second question first, part of the um, budget proposal that the governor has put out, one of the changes to the EPS formula is that no system administration costs will be covered or will be counted in the allocation for the local community. So for us, you know, we spend a million and a half dollars a year on system administration, which means central office. Um, but it also means um, property casualty insurance, work comp, it, it means um, legal services and contracted services for the whole district. It's not just the superintendent's salary, which I kind of think that Governor Page thinks that's what it is. It is. Right. That's one of my key talking points tomorrow, is to really just remind everyone that when we say system administration, it's not, it's not just superintendent. It's everything in the business office. It's payroll. It's benefits, it's payable, all of the all of the folks that work in the central office, um, all of the support staff that work in the central office, part of the assistant superintendent salary in our case. Um, but that's all reflected in your memo analysis of the EPS adjustment, right? Um, it's not part specific, but it's part of that calculation. Yeah. Absolutely. It's one of the yeah. right. So, yes. so, yes. so, so yeah, it's taken right. into account already. It's not. It, it wouldn't is. be an additional hit no. if we go with this number. No. It's that. it's factored into that number. Um, so yeah, that's one another cost shift. Is like look, we don't really want to pay for system administration at the state level. Y'all take care of that on your own. Um, and the MLTI thing to go back to that really quickly. Um, the State Department of Ed is saying that MLTI will not go away, but they're definitely not going to, well, nothing's definite, but at this point, they are not going to provide physical devices to seventh and eighth graders in the state of Maine. They're not going to 
buy devices and ship them out and manage them and own the infrastructure and own the image and make the updates and the changes and the repairs, they are going to provide some kind of grant to local communities so that they can do it themselves. And what we're fearful about is that when you say we're going to give you money from the state to local communities, why would it be any different from any other money they send us? Why would it not be need-based so that the folks that are in a, a, a less prosperous community would be able to get the grant and Scarborough, once again, would not? Yeah. So what we've worked out and what you'll hear as we go through this process is that part of that um, tech refresh budget, which we've consistently had over many years without one-to-one -one laptop devices, um, that funding, that same level of funding, we'll be using for the middle school next year, and our plan is to purchase our own devices and hope that we get some funding from the state to offset that cost, but to plan for it within the context of a normal tech refresh cost. But my understanding is we can actually administer our laptop program cheaper than MLTI. Is that correct? Yes, and, and well, and MLTI costs us right. because um, we have to pay for we have chosen to pay for sixth grade. We pay for um, additional staff laptops. Um, we pay for repairs that aren't covered by the state. Um, we pay for uh, more expensive devices than we might necessarily have chosen if we had chosen them on our own. So what Jen and the IT team have put together is a proposal that by purchasing our own Chromebooks for the middle school will cost us virtually the same amount that we're already spending on it. So I think that's a good talking point as well to get out there that, yes, we're losing the MLTI state funding program, but we're actually either breaking even or possibly it's a it's a net positive for the district if we now have local control over that and can manage that better. So uh, you know, on the surface, you know, because it's a sensitive issue in the community with laptops, um, I, I think that might be part of our a yeah. good messaging piece to explain that. And, yeah, and, and, and I think one of the other things that, you know, we can brag on behalf of Jen because she's the one who saw this coming. And one of the things that they did at the middle school last year, year and a half ago now, was to take out the infrastructure that was provided by MLTI, which was wonky and they weren't being supported and it wasn't working well and connectivity sucked. That's a technical term. It is, yeah. Yeah. Um, and they replaced that with. Um, our own network and interface so that they, that folks could have that connectivity and they could actually use the laptops effectively. Now MLTI is saying, we're going to go out and take our stuff back. So we're kind of done with you. Um, and so in Scarborough, we're past that. We don't have to panic and say, what are we going to do next? So you know, enormous amounts of forethought on the part of our IT team and seeing the writing on the wall and, and getting us past this where a lot of um, districts are really struggling. The other piece that Jen was talking about the other night at our board meeting was that we migrated to um, to HP and now we're migrating to Chromebooks instead of being dependent on Apple and the Apple relationship with the state and MLTI has turned into a nightmare where districts are getting huge bills for damaged equipment or missing equipment or lost equipment under the MLTI program that they didn't budget for and can't afford to pay. So I guess we're kind of closing in on the bewitching hour at the end of the um, <laughs> last item is just takeaways and to-dos and then to share. I've got to-do lists that I can share and we can or we can share. Um, any takeaways for anybody? Any thoughts, thoughts and comments, next agenda items? I would just say that tomorrow the budget hearing in Augusta it begins at 10 o'clock and if we have any community members who can go um, and testify I think that would be um, a bonus for us and a, and a much needed necessary support. Uh, one of the things I learned from my last experience going up to the um, to the legislative session is that it really does matter if you're there and that um, the legislators really do listen and they need community members, they need school board members, they need town councilors to come and help educate them and um, I found it to be a very positive and empowering uh, um, opportunity and I know that uh, I shared my testimony with Rebecca Millette um, of last week or before the snow cancellation and she gave me some feedback on it and said that you know, if you can get community members to come 
and testify, that would be a really good thing to do for Scarborough. So if anyone can go, it's really you know nerve-wracking the first time, but it's a positive experience, and I encourage all community members to and try so that's it at, at 10 a.m. 10 a.m. And so if people can't attend, is written testimony accepted? No, no you still can. If you, yeah, if you want to um, submit written testimony, you can still do that and send it to our local legislators. I would send it to either um, Heather Sraki or um, Rebecca Millett. As it's, a joint, it's a joint hearing, so they'll both be Actually, Rebecca's not your senator, though, right? Yours is Amy, you're Amy and Karen, right? Yeah. But, 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 I, but, I, but it's, it goes to the committee. Yeah, it's it's doesn't go to the, yeah, it doesn't go to the, it doesn't necessarily go to the committee. So does that have to be in by 10? Is the written testimony have to be in by 10? Oh, I don't know. Because they run copies of it for everybody. They do, but I don't know how long the record stays open. I think it depends on the clerk of the committee. Um, I, I don't know, Tom, you may know that. I don't know how long they accept written testimony yeah, I, for. I can't imagine it would stop. Yeah. Tomorrow morning, it's, yeah. Ongoing so it's, it's open. Yeah. It's open. Yeah. Okay. If you want, or maybe I mean, there's. I do know. You no, know, maybe you've got MMA group or something. Maybe they know. Sure. You know, or something like that. I, I, I mean, I'd be happy to do. It. I don't want to assign you tasks. That's not my role. But. <laughs> I feel comfortable with figuring that out quickly. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Going around. Well, takeaways. We will put together a. Uh, short survey around preferences for form and share those results. And do you also want a trust survey as well? I've got one on my list. Two, I want to get the uh, okay. budget form one out sooner just so we get the feedback back. And, and at this point, yeah, we do have the date and the venue for the large format, whatever that may look like. I think by what virtue of it being in Wentworth, it will look different. Um, has to because it's a different room and the tables instead of the chairs across and what have you, but it might give us an opportunity to freshen it up a little bit and decide that's where we want to go. Yeah, I think that's all good. I think you and I have got some time to spend together. It might be large coffee. <laughs> large coffee or several. <laughs> so for consistency, do not do we want to, we were going to do like a bullet we were going to put out for Twitter and Facebook, like, you know, okay. do we want to, do we want to, Get some work around that so that we're Is that as, well as in we had a meeting? Yeah, just kind of. The table. When we gonna, I think we were going to do that I'm consistently coming out of. I'm ready to cheat it if you have to find your board characters. <laughs> God save us Chris, all. Chris, I'm ready to cheat it. That's why. I thought that was words. I mean, pages. Yeah. Yes. That's why Chris is not going to be a Twitter man. I am not presidential material, right? Yeah, I think it's kind of recap what we did. Yeah, I thought we were going to kind of blast that out on social media. I thought we were going to try and continue to do that. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. 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 Thank thinking about it, that it's, it's coming, it's going to be a public document within the month. Stay tuned. Yeah. First Wednesday in April, whatever that date is. Be careful, all of our, all of our policy decisions now are going to be made in 100 plus characters. Have any dates on this sheet changed at all? Or times? Because I know our budget uh, yes. calendar has changed. So this, this is, uh, is the uh, old the version. Dates, the like dates have not changed. I think two departments had to switch for oh. conflict. But, All right. Well, that's the, the so finance. just so, so you know on the website portal. Like I printed this up today because I couldn't find the one that I had from before yeah. that I had notes written on. So if something's changed from this, it's not right. up to date on the. If you go to the budget section on the home page of yeah, okay, the we'll, we'll check it out. Oh, sure. and I need to update the fact that the school board leadership council workshop has changed from the Friday to the Thursday. Uh, so it's um, Thursday the 6th. It's, yeah, it was to be April 7th, the Friday afternoon. It is now Thursday afternoon the 6th. From 1.30 to 6. Oh, 1.30 to 6. And it's at 1.30? Yes. What was that one? What this is, um, that's the school board 
leadership Leader. council meeting, but we love having town council folks come to that. It's oh, that's the big one that you guys do every year, right? Yes. Yeah. And there's generally speaking lunch. Which is, you know, that we're, I thought we were going to have. We have this one thirty, so we're having dinner at six. Dinner at six. We don't get lunch. Are we doing dinner at six? Because we're starting at one thirty, and then we have to go into the school board six, and then there's a school board meeting. You guys get to spend the whole day together. Yeah. So awesome. Team building. Team building exercise. Any suggested agenda items for next time? Board issues? I was updates. We'll get the updates. Yeah, we'll yeah. yeah. talk about the like facility planning because I think that's you know, another big topic. Yeah, we'll, we'll carry that forward. Yeah. Um, and who's going to send me the agenda so that I can make it pretty? I'll do that this time because I think Peter did the last time. Yeah, I got Peter. Into Magic. <laughs> Magic handwriting. <laughs> it was not very good. You hand wrote it, but you did scan it. So you, when you scanned it, you became an electronic. Tech oh, okay. It yeah. became a halfway there. It's it halfway there. All right. I guess if that's it, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, Until next time. Public input. Oh, yes. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you very much. I did <laughs> 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 that was right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.